We all have secrets. Some are vowed to never be shared and are taken to the grave. Others eventually come to light. We can only hope that a person's dying words would help solve a mystery, but in some cases, they deepen them further instead. As the expression goes, you made your bed, now lie in it. This is a deathbed confession of the murder of William Desmond Taylor. The attractiveness and excitement of the movie industry would bring the paths of silent film stars Margaret Gibson and William Desmond Taylor together. But for one of them, it wouldn't end well. In fact, it ended tragically. And for the other, a spotlight once chased became a spotlight avoided. Let's unpack this by starting with the night of the murder. On the night of February 1st, 1922, sometime before 8.15 p.m., on what appeared to be an ordinary evening in Los Angeles, a shot was fired at the home of William Desmond Taylor that left him with a fatal wound through his back. Shortly before the incident, Taylor's actress friend and alleged low-key lover, actress Mabel Norman, was visiting him at his home. When his valet, Henry Peavy, arrived the following morning at his usual time of 7.30 a.m., he unlocked the front door and was met with an unexpected discovery. The lifeless body of William Desmond Taylor was found lying near the entrance of his home, faced up with blood around his mouth. After realizing that Taylor was dead, dressed in the same clothing as the day before, a shocked Peavy immediately shouted for help. A circus of curious and concerned friends and neighbors fill the home as police arrive at the scene. Upon an initial inspection, investigators theorized that Taylor had died of natural causes, but when the coroners finally arrived, his body was turned over where a bullet wound made it very clear that there was foul play involved. It was determined that he was shot with a 38 caliber to the left side of his back, and according to autopsy surgeon Dr. A.F. Wagner, the bullet struck Taylor six and a half inches below his armpit, moving upward and penetrating his left lung and exiting through his right chest. A robbery was quickly ruled out as Taylor's wallet was found containing $78 in cash, which is equivalent to over $1,300 in 2022. Other valuable items in the home were also left behind. Based on the placement of the bullet holes in Taylor's jacket and vest, it was concluded that his arms were raised at the time he was shot. Police considered that this could mean Taylor was embracing somebody who then shot him in the back. Though Taylor's name wasn't widely known outside of Hollywood before, his death still stirred up a media frenzy where it allegedly, quote, sold more newspapers everywhere in America than were ever sold by any item of news, not accepting war news before or since. But who would want him dead, and why? A number of witness accounts describe an unrecognized man hanging around Taylor's property on the night of the murder. Despite multiple reports, this alleged unknown killer is on a long list of persons of interest, which included, but was not limited to. Mabel Norman, Taylor's friend and rumored love interest, who was last seen with him just moments before his death, who was also seen leaving the property around 7.45 p.m., driven away by her chauffeur. Earlier, I mentioned that it's believed the murder took place around 8.15 p.m. This is because Taylor's own chauffeur recalled that during this time, as he routinely moved Taylor's car to his garage, he reported that when he went to return the keys to the car, as he usually did, Taylor did not answer the door, and he noted that the lights were still on. As the investigation went on, another detail would be added to the timeline of events. One of Taylor's neighbors told detectives that he and his wife believed they heard a sound that could have been a gunshot the night of the murder around 8 p.m. Only a few minutes had passed between the time that Mabel Norman left and when the neighbors heard what they thought was a gunshot. Police also found six cigarette butts in the alley where one witness claimed she'd heard somebody lingering on that fateful night. It was thought that the killer was waiting there for an opportunity to strike, and they could have entered Taylor's house in the minutes he was escorting Mabel to her car after her visit on the evening of February 1st. The conclusion was that Taylor was already dead when his chauffeur rang his doorbell at 8.15 p.m. to return his car keys and got no answer. Another person of interest was Mary Miles Minter, a young star who was openly infatuated with the director, possibly interested in him as more than just a friend, but their relationship was said to have been purely platonic. 
For context, there was a bit of an age gap between the two, and Minter had fallen for older men such as Taylor before. She'd grown up with an absent father, and some believed that she may have seen Taylor as a way to escape her overbearing mother. However, during the investigation, discovered among Taylor's possessions was a letter written to him from Minter, which read, Dearest, I love you, I love you, I love you. Nine little X's, one giant one, yours always, Mary. It was also rumored that a pink silky garment was found at the crime scene with the initials MMM on it. From this, a conspiracy theory emerged that the item was supposedly planted there by someone who was looking to frame Minter. The pink garment in question was never proven to belong to her, nor was its significance, let alone existence, ever truly verified. Charlotte Shelby, the mother of Mary Miles Minter who wasn't exactly keen on her relationship with the director and had started several arguments with him about being too close to her daughter. It's also reported that she was angry with Taylor because she believed he had deflowered Mary. According to some accounts, Shelby had even threatened to kill him on more than one occasion if he got too close to Mary again. Edward Sands A man who once worked for Taylor as his valet before fleeing and leaving his job behind. Why would he do this, you ask? Well, while working for Taylor, Sands had forged and cashed over $5,000 in checks from Taylor's account, as well as stealing some of his other valuables. Sands then disappeared, never to be seen or heard from again. Sort of. I say this because there's things that turn up in the investigation that suggests Sands might have later contacted Taylor in the form of a suspicious package from an anonymous sender, wherein a piece of jewelry that was stolen from Taylor in a separate home robbery was enclosed, along with a pawn slip for said jewelry. The package was signed alias Jimmy V, perhaps in reference to a film about a robber who frequently managed to evade police. However, according to Tinseltown author William J. Mann, the pawn ticket in the package had been signed with a different alias, William Deanne Tanner, a name to note. You see, as his valet, Sands worked closely with Taylor, and because of this, some believe that he may have known some of the director's secrets, one of which was that he wasn't exactly who he said he was. Allow me to specify a little. The well-loved and well-respected director was not born William Desmond Taylor. I know, not much of a surprise in the world of entertainment where a lot of people go by different names from their birth name. However, it was a new name, one he took on after abandoning a whole other life, which included a wife and child prior to becoming a Hollywood star. To his estranged family, William Desmond Taylor was William Cunningham Deanne Tanner. Because Taylor was held in such high esteem among the who's who of the movie industry, a past of this nature alone could have proven detrimental to his image, ruin his reputation, and potentially destroy his career. Other theories included the possibility that Taylor might have been murdered by drug dealers for being a vocal advocate against actors using drugs on set. He was a prominent figure in an attempt to clean up Hollywood's image and avoid censorship, which could have upset some people, leading them to plot against him. Also, according to Henry Peavy, his valet at the time of the murder, and Paramount screenwriter Julia Ivers, they'd noticed that Taylor had grown with Fran that winter, beginning at the end of 1921, which was around the same time of the robbery, where that piece of jewelry, which turned up in the suspicious package, was taken. PV and others close to Taylor also noted several mysterious phone calls that he received, seemingly with nobody on the other end of the line when he answered, which seemed to unnerve the director. Theories range from a crime of passion to vengeance to blackmail, and while any of these could have been the motive, one of them brings us back to a name that I mentioned earlier that I left out of the list of persons of interest. Remember Margaret Gibson? Well, in the early days of Taylor's movie career, he and Gibson starred in four films together that were released in 1914, where they developed a friendship of sorts. And, like many of us, both Gibson and Taylor had things in their past that they'd much rather keep in the past. Turns out, over the passing years since she and Taylor last worked together and seemingly drifted off in their separate ways, Gibson had not exactly been around good company. Her involvement with some shady characters led her down a path that some might argue may have jeopardized her career. Not to mention, like Taylor, Gibson herself underwent a few name changes in an attempt to salvage her image after a scandal in 1917 that landed her on the wrong side of the law for vagrancy. After this incident, Margaret Gibson began to go by a few new names, Patricia Palmer, Margaret Aker, and much later, 
Pat Lewis. But we'll continue referring to her as Margaret Gibson so as to not confuse things this late in the story. While most public theories surrounding Taylor's murder honed in on those closest to him at the time of his death, a possible theory less publicized, but perhaps known to police, was that during her friendship with Taylor, Gibson may have learned about his past identity. In addition, Taylor had also been fired from Vitagraph, where both he and Gibson had contracts, despite him being a successful star. Perhaps Gibson knew why he'd been fired seemingly in the middle of a lucrative contract. All of this was potentially damaging information, which could have easily positioned Taylor as a target for blackmail and extortion, presenting an opportunity that a troubled person with this kind of knowledge might not have been able to resist. In 1923, a year after the murder of William Desmond Taylor, Gibson, on her sketchy path, was connected to convicted blackmailers Don Osborne and Rose Putnam in an alleged extortion case where charges were dropped against her after she claimed it was a frame-up. This connection, paired with reports that Taylor was receiving mysterious phone calls leading up to his murder, along with friends recalling that he was acting somewhat strange during that time, would seem to hold some weight in supporting the blackmail-slash-extortion theory revolving around Gibson. However, it wouldn't be for many years before anything remotely close to possibly confirming this would emerge. Fast forward to one evening in 1964. A now 70-year-old Margaret Gibson, known to her neighbors as Pat Lewis was reportedly watching television with her neighbor, as she often did, when a local TV show came on that, to her surprise, was covering the murder of William Desmond Taylor. Gibson reportedly became hysterical. According to her neighbor, it was at this moment Gibson initially claimed responsibility for the late director's death. The neighbor kept this to herself and wouldn't mention this to her son until much later. On the afternoon of October 21st, 1964, commotion coming from Gibson's home prompted her neighbors to go and check on her. Turns out, Gibson had suffered a heart attack and was in need of medical attention. While waiting for medical help, Gibson asked her neighbors for a priest so she could confess her sins. But it seemed that the heaviness of her guilt could no longer bear the test of time, as there was no time to source a priest. Gibson was left with no other choice but to unburden her Tinseltown secret right then and there to her neighbors instead. According to the neighbors, in her confession, dying as Pat Lewis, Gibson told them that she had been a silent film actress and had shot and killed a man by the name of William Desmond Taylor, after which she fled the country and was allegedly nearly caught. According to author and historian William J. Mann, he's not convinced that she killed him with her own hands, but perhaps was responsible for him becoming a target for blackmail due to possible secrets she may have known from working with him in years past. Gibson's connection to convicted blackmailer Don Osborne seems to be the seed of this theory. In addition, Gibson was 5 foot 1 inches tall, and the person witnesses saw the night of the murder was described as a tall man. Her neighbors also reported that they assumed Gibson was speaking nonsense due to the pain she was in, also mentioning that she'd made other claims that they could not fully recall. That being said, it's important to note that leading up to this confession, her neighbors supposedly knew nothing about William Desmond Taylor or how he died, but the first person account of her confession specifically used the word shot. While Gibson allegedly confessed in the 1960s, it seems that it took the son of the neighbor more than 30 years to go public with the confession he had heard. Whether or not her confession was taken into consideration, it certainly makes one less secret taken to the grave. And scene. <laughs> 